The Cellar. Thomas Messick Sr. was an 82-year-old former U.S. Army paratrooper, hunter, and survival expert. In November of 2015, Tom and six friends and family members would embark on a hunting trip, which would take them to Lily Pond. Lily Pond is an area located just east of Brant Lake, which is part of a hamlet in the town of Horicon, New York, in Warren County. That is where Thomas Messick would vanish without so much as a trace. What happened to Thomas Messick? Why has not a single trace of him been found in the eight years since he went missing? In today's episode, we're going to dive into this extremely baffling case. For me, this is another one that hits close to home. My mother lives just outside of Troy, New York, the city where Thomas Messick was living at the time of his disappearance. With the eight-year anniversary taking place this past November, I thought it was as good a time as ever to dive down the rabbit hole that is the disappearance of Thomas Messick. Thomas Messick Sr. was born March 14, 1933, in Troy, New York. After graduating from high school, Thomas would join the Army, where he would go on to be a paratrooper. Following his time in the Army, Thomas would take his skills and apply them to hunting and survival training. Thomas was an avid outdoorsman, and he had a passion for teaching others how to be better equipped before heading out into the wilderness. Being a survival expert himself, he would go on to teach survival training courses for many years. Thomas was an avid hunter. He would start a tradition some 55 years earlier of taking an annual hunting trip with friends and family members. Typically, the men would all hunt at a shared hunting camp, which was located in Haig, New York. Haig is a town in northeastern Warren County, New York, located on the scenic Lake George. If you take a look at the map, you will see that Haig, New York is located roughly 12.8 miles from Lily Pond. According to reports, the men headed up to the camp and on November 15, 2015, they decided to travel to Lily Pond to do a few hours of hunting. The plan at that point was to have the older men in the group set up in a line. The idea was that the older men in the group would have an easier time if they were all in an area where they could stay put. So four of the men, including Tom, set up in a line along the access road near Lily Pond. They would put around 100 yards or so in between each other and travel 40 to 50 yards off the road and find a spot to sit and wait. Tom's wife stated in an interview that if Tom was a watcher, he would have stayed put and watched. The younger men in the group would then travel around and to the opposite side of a hill. The goal was to have the younger men drive any potential deer that they found back into the direction where the older men were sitting, waiting, with rifles ready. By around 2.30 to 3.30 p.m. in the afternoon, the men would all meet back up at the pre-planned meeting spot. The men would soon come to a realization that Tom was nowhere to be found. Now to give more insight into this case, each member of the party had a walkie-talkie on them. Knowing that if Tom had been in trouble, he would have called over the walkie-talkie, the group didn't immediately panic. They hiked together to the spot where Tom had been left, but when they arrived, they were baffled at what they found. Nothing. No sign of Thomas was present in the spot he had been left just a handful of hours before. His gun, his gear, and Tom himself had all seemingly just vanished. By 4.30 p.m., the group called in forest rangers to assist in searching for Tom. It would get dark by around 7 p.m. that evening. At that point, half the group would stay near the car, honking the horn and firing their rifles in order to try and alert Tom to their position. The rest of the men would leave the scene, and that's when Tom was reported missing to authorities. Now in this region in November, it can get pretty cold at night. Tom was equipped in wearing his duck boots, camouflage pants and coat, a pair of gloves, and a red and black checkered hat. He was also carrying his rifle and a walkie-talkie. To add to the bizarre nature of it all, Tom never reached out on the walkie-talkie, nor did he ever respond to any requests from the group. By the following morning, 
Tom's friends and family were getting more and more worried, but they still had faith that Tom would be found. Given Tom's extensive survival training, if anyone could survive a night out in the woods, even at age 82, it would be Tom. The search would start on November 16th with 13 trained SAR professionals from the Park Service. To put it as simple as I can, the search for Tom was very well organized from the beginning. This was not a case where the ball was dropped from the get-go. No, Tom's search was underway and extremely thorough. Over the next several days and weeks, more than 300 professionals and volunteers were assisting on a daily basis. Dogs, divers, and helicopters would scour the area. Day two would begin and it would prove to be a tough one as weather would roll in and the rain would make things very difficult on all those involved in the search. The state police aviation unit would also search a large area by air with the aid of a helicopter. From all reports, the searchers covered numerous miles of ground standing shoulder to shoulder. But as the days continued on, not a single trace of Tom would be found. Now, many have discussed how the rain could have destroyed and washed away possible evidence. But from what I found in all the reporting, sniffer dogs were brought in prior to the rain getting bad. All I could find in regards to the dogs was that they did in fact locate a hit on Tom, but that they subsequently would lose it rather quickly. I've also seen some reports that the dogs never found anything, so it's unclear where the truth lies in this matter. Either way, it was almost like he was there one second and just vanished the next. On day four of the search for Tom, a couple of FBI tactical officers would arrive on scene. Now, for some of you, this may not sound odd, but it's a weird moment in this case, as the FBI does not get involved in adult cases of missing persons unless a crime is believed to have taken place. But from all reports, foul play has never been suspected in this case. So why was the FBI there? And why did they show up as quickly as they did? Now, we could dive real deep into the rabbit hole, as some people believe the presence of the FBI is a sign of something more sinister transpiring within the woods throughout the United States. Whether there is any truth to it, I truly don't know. For the sake of trying to remain as impartial as possible with my reporting of the case, I will simply say that I don't know why they chose to show up for this case in particular. But if you'd like to dive a little deeper into the conspiracy surrounding this case and others, then I would highly recommend you watch the Missing 411 The Hunted documentary. They dive into this case and a handful of others, and I will say I enjoyed the film. I'm not one to typically lose myself down the rabbit hole, but it is interesting to think and wonder if there could be something more sinister lurking within the vast forests across the globe. By Thanksgiving Day, the full-scale search was called off for Tom Messick. More small searches would take place over the next few months and into January, but not a single piece of evidence was ever found, and to this very day, nothing has ever been recovered. We will now take the time to dive into some theories surrounding this baffling case. As always, whenever I dive into a case like this, I like to follow Occam's razor. The simplest answer is usually the correct one. Now, does that mean that the more outlandish theories and ideas are all completely bogus? No, not at all. We have nothing to go on at this point, so all we can do is speculate and talk about what potentially transpired. So I will start things off with the easiest theory. He wandered off and succumbed to the elements. Now, Tom was a survival expert, but he was also 82 years old. He was blind in one eye and mostly deaf in one ear. Is there a chance he could have wandered off and died? It's possible. He could have fallen and hit his head. He could have suffered a heart attack or a stroke of some kind. But that leaves the question of where is the body and all of his belongings? Now. Tom was wearing a bunch of camouflage. This inherently makes it more difficult to locate his body, and maybe he was just missed in all the searches. This has happened in numerous other cases, and would it really be a surprise if Tom's body was one day located somewhere within the areas that were already searched? Now, given all the info we have, I believe this is 100% possible, but for me, it just doesn't feel likely. Tom had a walkie-talkie, why wasn't it ever used to call for help? Tom was an expert, and he would have known what to do if he got lost or injured. 
I feel that given how thorough the search was, how experienced Tom was, and the fact that his walkie-talkie was never used to call for any kind of help, something more sinister had to have transpired within this case. So that brings us to foul play. Now, there are a few theories in regards to foul play. Some believe that Tom was accidentally killed and his murder was covered up. Some believe that he may have been abducted from the area and killed and buried somewhere else, while some believe that he was never in the woods in the first place. Now, the idea that he was never in the woods in the first place stems from some reports from searchers and locals living in the area. Some believe that because of how thorough the search was and the fact that nothing was ever discovered, that means he just wasn't there. Now, that could be the case, but what's the motive behind any of it? Some have pointed fingers at the family, but I just don't see it being what happened. You also have to take into consideration that if he wasn't there at all, then all those that were on that hunting trip, you also have to take into consideration that if he wasn't there at all, then all of those that were on that hunting trip would have had to keep their mouth shut for the last eight years. On top of that, all of them would have had to have agreed that staging a hunting disappearance was the best course of action. I'm a believer that a secret as big as that is hard enough to be kept quiet by a couple of people, let alone an entire group of people, including relatives like Tom's own son. After watching numerous stories on this case and digging into all the details out there, I just don't believe the family is lying in the story that they're telling. If the family truly wanted to stage a hunting trip gone wrong, they could have done it a lot better. As a matter of fact, if they wanted to make it all more believable, they would have left some evidence behind to show that Tom was indeed there in the woods with them on that day. The lack of proof of Tom even being there leads me to believe that this wasn't staged. Also, Tom's medication and some of his belongings were found back at their camp. Based on interviews with his son, his wife, and his friends, I just don't see them all being on board with some big cover-up in the death of Tom. It seems like they all truly cared for him, and they are just as baffled about what happened. Could he have been killed in a hunting accident and those around him panicked and disposed of his body and possessions? This is another possibility, but based on everything that transpired, it just doesn't seem right. For instance, if that did go down, then why would members of the hunting trip agree to be featured in a documentary film like Missing 411? If I was involved in a situation like that, the last thing I would want is to do more interviews and potentially give away information that contradicts information that was already given. Also, my same logic applies that keeping a secret like that amongst numerous people is not easy. You would think that someone would have cracked or slipped up some info to someone by now. There's also the simple fact of why. If an accident occurred, why hide it or cover it up? For me, it just doesn't feel plausible. Now, that leads me to abduction. Could Tom have been killed or abducted by someone that he ran into in the woods? Now, this theory I think has a little bit more credibility. Given Tom's age and the fact that he's partially blind and deaf, I could see someone sneaking up on him. Now, what reason would someone have to do this? That I don't know. Maybe a local didn't like seeing a group like this hunt within the area. Maybe someone confronted Tom about the manner in which they were hunting and it led to an exchange that got violent and left Tom dead. One piece of information that was shared by those within the hunting group has sparked a lot of debate. It was reported that a sound was heard that couldn't be placed. It was described as the sound of a metal trap of some sort slamming shut. Now. Some have pointed to the idea that maybe this was a vehicle door, or maybe the tailgate on a pickup truck being slammed shut. But from the Missing 401 documentary, it was reported that this sound transpired over near the hill and not in the direction of where Tom was stationed. The only thing that gives me pause from this idea is the fact that from all reports, Tom had someone only a hundred or so yards from him during the hunting trip. So how could someone abduct Tom and get away with little to no notice. Now, I watched a video about this case that was done by the Lore Lodge. Within the video, they traveled to the area relatively close to where Tom went missing, 
They tested the idea of being a hundred or so yards away and the fact that you could still very clearly hear what was being said. You also need to take into account that they ran this test during the summer months when the trees are full of leaves and sound is even more muddled by this fact. Now, in November, when Tom went missing, sound would have traveled even more clearly with the trees being all but barren at that time of the year. So it continues to beg the question, how could someone abduct Tom without being noticed? The only logical conclusion that I can come to is that perhaps Tom didn't stay put where he was. There's a four to five hour period where Tom could have wandered off. Now Tom could not have wandered off too far on his own, but four to five hours could have given him enough time to wander to a point where he came upon someone with bad intentions. This person could have made Tom give up his gun and walkie talkie. This person could have then simply walked Tom out of the woods at gunpoint into a vehicle that was far enough away and then taken Tom with little to no notice. Perhaps that sound that was heard was the only sound made during Tom's abduction. I would say that based on all the facts that we have and the fact that not a trace of Tom has ever been found, this could potentially be a logical answer as to what happened to Tom Messick. I would say that in all of this, the two most logical ideas would be that Tom ran into someone with bad intentions or that Tom simply wandered off a bit and died somehow and his body just hasn't been recovered as of yet. But there are some other ideas floating around out there, including the idea that something else was in the woods with the men on that day. It was reported by the hunting party that the woods seemed absolutely dead on November 15th of 2015. While searchers would go on to report the same thing during the first few days of looking for Tom. No birds, squirrels, deer, or any animal of any kind could be heard. This was odd enough that numerous people felt the need to share this info and point out how bizarre it felt. So the question becomes, what was out there in the woods? Now, according to the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization's report, there have been 13 reports within Warren County of potential Bigfoot sightings. These date back from the spring of 1990 to August of 2018. The neighboring Washington County has 11 reports, while Essex County, which is farther north, has a total of 9 reported sightings. That's a total of 33 sightings within 3 closely connected counties with vast amounts of wilderness. Now, Whitehall, New York is roughly an hour away from Brant Lake. Why do I bring that up? Well, there's a documentary titled The Beast of Whitehall. In it, they dive into numerous reported Bigfoot sightings that took place in 1976 within the Whitehall region. These sightings are not just of normal everyday civilians either. There were numerous law enforcement officers who also reported seeing something that when described, sounds like it could have been the ever elusive Bigfoot. Now, do I ultimately believe in Bigfoot or Sasquatch? I can't say that I outright do. But do I believe that there could be something strange happening in the dense, untamed forests throughout the world? I can't argue the fact that people have seen the unexplained. Whether it's Bigfoot or the Wendigo, there have been stories and reported sightings of creatures that lurk and hunt within the woods that span hundreds of years. Do I believe something like this got Tom? I can't ultimately say I can rule it out. The logical side of my brain says that there is a far more simple answer as to what happened to Thomas Messick, but the details surrounding Tom's case are baffling. If all the information we have been given from the hunting party is accurate, then Tom shouldn't have been able to disappear, let alone disappear without a trace. Now, I would love to know what each and every one of you think. So please take the time to leave a comment below and share your thoughts on this story. Also, if you have any similar stories or cases you think I should check out, you can shoot me an email using the link located in the description box below. If you enjoy the content I make, please take a moment to hit that like and subscribe button. It helps the channel continue to grow. Also, you can check the description box below and find the link to my merch store. Tons of awesome designs and the proceeds help fund the channel. For those of you that are interested, I have a Cellar Dwellers membership tier for the channel. It's $2.99 a month and comes with some pretty cool perks. So if that interests you, then please go check it out. I have that also linked in the description box below. As always, I do all the research, writing, recording, and editing for the channel myself. So anything that you do to support the channel is greatly appreciated. 
Until next time, I will see you all again as we head back into the cellar. <laughs>